David K. Johnston, everybody. Hello, Mark. Hello, Jim. sir. Thank you for uh, being with us. You know, one of the questions, and I know we've got it's against all this backdrop in the Middle East stuff. We did a lot of that in the first hour. But I'd like to get to something that people have been asking me to ask you. And that is this Trump case, and it's still going on in a big, big way, where he values his properties sort of out of out of the air. I mean, where he literally just picks, and you've heard Michael Cohen talk about this, you've heard, and, and Trump, it's certainly it's been demonstrated, has just done this, create value right out of his head as to what his assets are in terms of uh, these properties and then borrowing against it. The question I'm getting, I've gotten like five emails to ask you, how is this possible? And you've written books about this stuff. How is it possible that those with high net worth or those in this world of high-end real estate can do that with, with utter impunity? Well, because of the way we fail to regulate the banking system and banking regulation is not something new. Uh, there's bank, there's proto banking regulation in Hammurabi's code, which is from almost 4,000 years ago. And it's because of the fee structure and the way bankers get paid. Uh, after all, if you're the bank executive who arranges a multi hundred million dollar loan to someone who perhaps doesn't really qualify, wouldn't qualify if it were a, uh, a mortgage for someone on a smaller scale, uh, you're going to collect a tremendous fee. So it creates these enormous incentives because after all, it's not your money. And if the loan goes sour, the bank doesn't come to you and make you pay up. So the, 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 there's two problems. The failure to properly regulate banks, which is not a new or unknown phenomenon of how to do this. And the second is these fee structures uh, that uh, encourage this kind of behavior. And the reason it should matter, even if the loan is paid back, is that banks don't have an infinite capacity to loan money. The size of what, what's known in banking as their footings has a big role to play in the size of their loan package. And the kinds of loans Trump took out are not the kind that a bank makes and then sells into the federally supervised Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac system. These are, they may be syndicated, that is a lot of banks may buy a piece of it, but it's, it's a different and separate system. And so if Donald Trump gets a loan that he shouldn't get or gets a loan for more than he should get, it means somebody else didn't get a loan or didn't get as good terms as a loan. This is not a victimless crime, but it is a subtly victimhood crime. And is it common in high-end real estate? Well, not to the extent that Donald does this. And, and I would here take you back to think about your own house. So my house here in, in Rochester, New York, uh, Zillow says it's worth, I think, $450,000. So if I go to uh, the bank and want a mortgage and try to persuade them it's worth 475 or maybe 500 or persuade the local tax authorities it's really only worth 400 we're in a reasonably narrow range here. If I go, however, to the bank and say, oh, I want a uh, $5 million loan against my house, and here, here are these documents that say it's worth $5 million. Pay no attention to the statement on the front that says these are not done according to generally accepted accounting principles. Um, that's fraud. That's just outright fraud. So it, there's a range here where it's you're being a little aggressive one way or the other, but there's Donald Trump range. So when he says his apartment in Trump Tower, which is 58 stories, not as he says 68, is 30,000 plus square feet when it's really about 10,000, that's fraud. Uh, when he says his um, uh, white, uh, sil uh, white Springs, uh, Silver Springs, I'm sorry, Silver Springs um, uh, mansion and grounds in Westchester County, uh, just outside Manhattan, are worth $291 million. The highest appraisal on him is about 30 million, a tenth as much. And that's based on the assumption that he could carve it up and sell off eight sites uh, for mansions. And the local authorities have said, no, no, you may never cut this up. This is the size of this property, end of discussion, which means it's worth a lot less than $30 million. Now we're just talking flat out fraud. But 
the banks have to look the other way, as you say, they're incentivized along the way to okay it. Uh, it reminds me right. of the high end art world where those appraisers are essentially incentivized to appraise things higher. Aren't right. there appraisers within this world that are held to account if something, you know, don't they have comps the way that you use your house as yes. an example? I mean, they have to find comps usually, don't they? Um, <laughs> yes, Comp you, you look for comparable properties if you live in a neighborhood like mine, where every house was built by a, you know, a different builder over a 50 year period, uh, they're not exactly comparable. You know, this many square feet, this many bedrooms, this style, the kind of style house I have uh, is worth less than a colonial, for example. Um, but also, um, let me, a little history lesson here. Uh, back around 2005 or six, 11,000 mortgage appraisers, about a third of all mortgage appraisers, wrote to the FBI and said, we're not getting business because we won't give dishonest appraisals. We are not inflating the values of appraisals as demanded by Countrywide down in Ventura and other banks that were in the business of making loans that were no good, that sank the economy. And the FBI did nothing. In fact, what the FBI did back then was it partnered with the very banks that were ripping off people and messing up the economy. And the FBI put out a statement, which I wrote about in one of my economics books, in which it said that America was suffering from two kinds of bank fraud. One was people buying houses they really couldn't afford uh, by lying about them. And the other was some other consumer corrupt act. They gave no thought at all and when I called them, they were like, are you nuts? To the idea that maybe the bankers themselves were the crooks. Uh, and that's what Bill Black wrote. Uh, he was the you know, just mid-level banking regulator in San Francisco who uncovered the savings and loan scandal 30 some years ago, uh, resulted in over 3000 uh, indictments, more than 800 senior banking officials, not little small fry, but CEOs and other high level banking officials went to prison because of Bill. And uh, Bill later uh, was went and got a degree, in, a doctoral degree in criminology and wrote a book, uh, The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One. <laughs> and he came up he came up with this brilliant new theory in criminology. He's, he's actually, his degree is, his doctoral degree is not in sociology, it's in a subset, criminology. And that was what he called control fraud. So, you know, the CEO of the company you're taught in economics and business school is the agent of the shareholders and directors, and he's supposed to, he or she's supposed to run the company in their interest. And yeah, they'll, you know, pad their expenses and, you know, get themselves a nicer jet and things like that. But overall, they're looking out for the shareholders. And control fraud, it's, oh, no, we're here to loot the place and we're going to loot it as fast and best we can. And when it collapses, if we've kept it alive long enough, say more than three years, the market turned on us. There was nothing we could do. Wow. Wow. Best way game. to own a rob a bank. Own one. What a game. What a racket. Yeah. Uh, and the problem is that this also encourages honest bankers to misbehave. Uh, you know, when, when government doesn't enforce the rules, the not only are the consumers losers, but so are honest business people. And most business people are not corrupt. They're not dishonest. Uh, you know, Angela Mozillo, who somehow escaped prosecution and whose federal fines of like $600 million dollars were paid for by insurance bought by the shareholders of the place that he looted uh, countrywide. Uh, he walked away basically unscathed. Uh, Mnuchin, the uh, Treasury Secretary under Trump, who was infamous for foreclosing on people over you know the littlest thing to get get a hold of their houses, uh, nothing happened to him. He became Treasury Secretary of the United States, and there's a we have a real fundamental problem with not enforcing and not. In putting up enough money for white collar crime enforcement. And then we've made many white collar crimes now beyond the scope of prosecution because of Supreme Court decisions that have um, narrowed, you know, what's a white collar crime? I see. Uh, uh, could you expand on that? Because that, that's well, intriguing. The, 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 the most notorious case involved the governor of Virginia, McDonald, and his wife. 
And there was a guy who had a business in Virginia uh, for which he needed favors from the state to prosper. And he gave uh, the governor's wife um, a shopping trip to Manhattan that cost, I think it was a quarter million dollars. Uh, he provided them with the use, not the ownership of a, a car like a Ferrari, a very, very expensive sports car and other favors and was convicted of uh, corruption, um, uh, dishonest services. And the Supreme Court threw that out. And essentially the Supreme Court said, so long as you don't say, well, listen, if you do this specific official act, I will give you this gift. It's not corruption. Well, that's nonsense. I mean, does somebody walk up to you who wants to bribe you and say, listen, do this act, I'll do that. So, no, it's more like, you know, I, I really could use your help. And by the way, wouldn't you love to have the use of my private jet for the week? Uh, it, it's not a quid pro quo. And the, the, there's a very good book called Corruption in America by Zephyr Teachout. Very unusual name, Zephyr Teachout. She is a professor of law here in New York, at, I think Fordham. And uh, she starts off with the scandal of a bejeweled snuff box, you know, uh, tobacco you put up your nose, that the King of France gave to our ambassador, Benjamin Franklin. And this was like a major national scandal because the framers of our constitution, they understood individual venal, venality will occur. There will be people who are corrupt. They were concerned about institutional corruption and our Supreme Court has basically authorized institutional corruption. You just got to do it with a wink and a nod. And you can get away with it. Because you're saying unless unless there's a quid pro quo, demonstrably quid pro quo, then the court allows it. Yep. And yeah. and it, it's, uh, it's horrible. So you combine that with fee structures that encourage dishonest uh, loans and add to that a lack of enforcement. It's one of the things you almost never read in the news. Well, Congress passed a new law to crack down on X. Oh, yeah. Well, how many people did they hire? Um, years ago, um, I was studying uh, unpaid wages. The Old Testament has a lot of talk about the need to pay wages to your workers. And it turns out that there was a trial in ancient Egypt around 1450 before the Common Era, so more than 3,000 years ago, by a guy who said he didn't get paid. And we have a whole record of this trial. And today we have what are called wage and hour courts. You know, you, your boss doesn't pay you. You can go to the state government and uh, they will look into this. We had more federal labor inspectors in 1940 when there were only about 100 million Americans than we do today with 330 million Americans. And lo and behold, what's one of the most rampant things going on? Not in the places you and I work in, which are known as primary employment. But in the people who have marginal jobs, they're getting ripped off left and right. Uh, and there's no enforcement because there's not enough inspectors to go deal with it. And so employers feel, some employers, those employers inclined to be dishonest, feel emboldened. So at the top and at the bottom, yeah. the em enforcement is is quite lax. Right. And everybody, uh, everybody in between, you know, we just, we get the bill. Yeah, we get the bill. And, and, you know, it's pointed out in the chat as well that, you know, these payoffs of politicians and uh, the enforcement mechanisms and whether or not to, you know, bring some kind of legal action is oftentimes influenced by donations of, you know, oh, it, you've spoken about this, PG&E yeah, the, is mentioned and yeah. The incentive system for politicians is just awful. It's been made much worse by the post Watergate reforms. And the reality is that if you're a, a congressman or a congresswoman or a senator, your real constituency is your donors. It's not it's not John Q. Citizen. Uh, uh, those are the people who who uh, you know who matter. I I had some people in my backyard twenty five almost twenty five years ago one summer evening, and um, I remarked that you know big donors can get their congressperson on speed dial. But if you ask your congressperson, I'd like five minutes with you next time you're in town, you probably can't get it. Whereupon one of my guests, a very successful businessman, flips open his phone. That's how far back this was, flip phones, pushes one button and says, oh, Louise, how you doing? Who was our local congresswoman, a wonderful congresswoman. <laughs> but he had her on speed dial. <laughs> and they're in the difference. That's great. Yeah. Uh,
Hey, let me ask you, you mentioned uh, politicians and there's a pretty titanic, potentially, a change in, I'm not not unanticipated, but uh, pretty big nonetheless, uh, change in the uh, presidential race as RFK Jr. has officially declared as an independent that he will run for president. Um, it's, it, it, I think it will be destabilizing, but I'm curious to know your take on that and where you think he'll take votes. Well, they take, you know, it's not purely Democrats who he'll take votes from, it wouldn't seem. Third party candidates have again and again been spoilers. Uh, if um, Ross Perot had not run in 92, Bill Clinton would not have become president. Um, a lot of people believe that um, Ralph Nader cost Al Gore the election in 2000, in 2000. but uh, there's some very good political science research by people who set out to prove that that says, nah, actually, it's not true. It's an urban legend. But it certainly was not helpful that Ralph ran. And here you, what we're seeing in politicians these days is more and more crazy people running. And Robert F. Kennedy, if you listen to the thing, Junior, if you listen to the things he's been saying, you know, he's he's in the nutball caucus. Um, uh, his his ideas and, and, about yeah, go vaccines ahead. Give it, put some... alone, his ideas about vaccines alone mm -hmm. just tell you that, you know, he's he's nuts. And, you know, if you look at his life circumstances as he grew up, it's kind of easy to understand why. Uh, he might end up being the kind of nutcase that he is, but this is this is not a good thing. Parties used to enforce discipline, and parties saw to it that the people who ran were sort of widely agreed upon competent people to be in the White House. You know, you didn't have to like Coolidge or Hoover or FDR, but nobody thought they were incompetent. Um, and but, now but, we have all sorts of people running who are, they're just flat out, they're incompetent. They have no business being in political office. Well, you have a new phenomenon too, David, it would seem, which is associated with, uh, it, it takes name recognition to another level. They've always talked about name recognition in, in relation to uh, presidential runs or to any kind of political office. Yep. But the idea somehow that you're a brand, you know what I mean? That, that, that many of the things that these legislators do are associated with burnishing their brand. I think that has actually gotten in the way of getting things done legislatively. You find a, you know, an issue, uh, maybe it's a women's reproductive rights, maybe it's a, right. a aid to Ukraine, and you make it the thing that you want to shut the government down or you want to shut military promotions down. And in, in so doing, you, I think, rise to another level when it comes to uh, your brand. And I, I feel like the, the RFK Jr. brand has a degree of popularity and traction that really could push this race one way or another. Oh, no, I, I think there's the potential, if he doesn't flame out um, for real difficulty, probably much more for the Democrats than the Republicans. Um, and, uh, you know, branding is a very important issue. You know, my, my late brother used to say, uh, uh, have you ever noticed that every shampoo bottle is different? And I said, yeah. And he said, well, it's because you go shopping and you don't have to think, oh, uh, my wife uses this brand in the uh, dry hair version. You just, oh, it's that shape bottle with the green cap, not the pink cap. Oh, that's and, clever. Actually, I never thought of that. <laughs> and and, you know, and my, you know, my brother was a, was a security guard and a ditch digger, but he had some great insights. Yeah. And the... Um, the same thing applies here in politics. People, you know, you don't know these people. You don't know me or you or the people you see on the CBS Evening News. You know what you see in this little box uh, or here over the air. Um, and you really have to pay attention to people's policies. But unfortunately, a lot of people vote on the principle of, gee, I would much rather have a beer with George W. Bush than Al Gore. Me included, by the way. Uh, uh, but that right. doesn't make... That doesn't make one man qualified and the other not. It has nothing to do with that. And if we get cynical, all politicians are corrupt, all bankers are corrupt, you know, then we don't get anywhere. We need to recognize that most people try to do the right thing within some reasonable grounds. And we really need to pay attention to the outliers like Donald Trump, uh, uh, RF Kennedy and, uh, you know, Lauren Boebert and, and uh, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Matt Gates, pay attention to these people and say, how is it that they're in office? 
and try to get a better quality of people in, drawn into public service. Uh, it's sad because I feel as though public service is being informed now by a kind of radicalism that scares people. You know, yeah. I, uh, we've talked about it just in the course of speaking about poll workers and those who are public servants. You know, all of a sudden it's become a dangerous thing. Uh, there's a it's a scary time in, in the politics of America. But to your point, I mean, it seems as though competence is not something that even makes sort of the top three in yeah. terms of uh, things that you evaluate. I mean, Trump's a classic example, you know. Yeah, I, I had a, we had a, a flood in our basement from a broken water pipe uh, uh, just now, is it finally after a month getting all fixed. And I had a tradesman in my house this morning. He's a liberal Democrat. And he said to me, you know, Donald Trump's a terrible person and he terrible things, but I really loved his policies. And I go, what policies? And you know, he says, well, gas prices, you know, they were down at two dollars and twenty cents a gallon. And I went, yeah, there was a pandemic on. People were dying. People weren't driving as much. Well, but I want to I want to get that back. Uh, by the way, Putin invaded Ukraine. Yeah, but but Joe Biden, higher gas prices. Uh, the, 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 we need to develop a politics in this country like the, I was in Europe for the last four weeks in six countries. And a politics that you have there is much more sophisticated. You can have a much better conversation with a random waiter at a sidewalk cafe in, in Paris or Stockholm than with your average American with a college degree. Wow. So there is I, one thing I want to make sure we cover today, Mark. Yes, sir, please. Um, it came out I don't know, 10 days ago that Donald Trump told an Australian businessman, a billionaire, um, nuclear secrets, how close American submarines can get to Russian submarines and the Russians cannot detect them. And uh, the number of missiles and payloads of uh, the uh, the boomers, the big nuclear submarines, not the attack submarines, what they carry, and apparently other things, but those were the two highlights. These are incredibly super secret things. The technology that our government has developed to create um, propellers for nuclear submarines so they don't have bubbles and make no, any noise. We have spent unbelievable sums of money over the last 60 years refining that technology. And Donald Trump shot his mouth off about it. And the guy he spoke to then, of course, went on and told a whole bunch of other people. I want to talk about treason. Um, you can't commit treason because we're not at war, but uh, the concept of being treason us is perfectly valid. And this goes to a point I didn't want to make until now when we have some clear evidence of this. And that is Donald Trump committed crimes against our national security that you're never going to hear about and will never be prosecuted because to do so would require exposing the information widely, and we can't do that. But if you think this was a one-off, where just one time Donald Trump shot his mouth off to, to impress somebody, an Australian businessman, with his secret knowledge from being president, you're being incredibly naive. Donald Trump, because he has no controls and he has no ethical standards. He has no, you know, he doesn't think anything wrong when he was plying a 12 year old girl with liquor and limousines in hotel rooms. So she'd gamble because she was rich and as well, 13 and 14 year olds. He sees nothing wrong with this. Uh, there's much more than we will know, in, perhaps forever and certainly not in the lifetimes of our grandchildren about what Trump did shooting off his mouth. Well, this is really intriguing, David, and I know we only have a minute or so left, but I wonder if you can just follow with then how is anything protected if when things that are, should be so dearly protected are protected after the fact and you can't hold those who reveal them to account? I mean, well, it, you know, it, this I, is I, one I, of the reasons that I think in the case of Donald, it is imperative that we put him behind bars. He gets tried and convicted and put behind bars so that he can't continue to do these things. Uh, but we need to be very concerned about other politicians who might do that. And uh, Donald is, is pretty much a unique case in terms of no accountability, no understanding, and no moral character at all. None. Doesn't exist. Empty, empty vessel. 
But I would worry a great deal about a number of other people if they got into office um, lying and giving away secrets. You know, it, it just came out in court um, that the DeSantis administration in Florida, which insisted that it had no data on COVID deaths and medical practice, had tons of it. They just lied and hid. 87,000 people died, probably about 80,000 of them unnecessarily because of that. And so we need to have a culture of the kind that the framers sought and Zephyr Teachout wrote about in her book, Corruption, that holds you to a high standard of behavior. And, you know, you may not like George W. Bush or Barack Obama or Bill Clinton, but none of them went around giving away our secrets just to impress somebody with what they knew. Yeah, I mean, th certainly that's true. Um, it's... <sighs> I feel it's incumbent upon the media, uh, in, in, to, but but the media has become so fractured and siloed that I know it, it's difficult to get this out. But I, I feel this voracious appetite that the that the news cycle has sort of loses this. I mean, uh, yeah, especially right. when it's when it's all about one issue. I mean, right now Donald Trump's civil trial is still going on. Try to find a news story about it. There are reporters in the courtroom. It's all the war in the Middle East, which I don't want to get into because I sure, don't know. No, I, I, I get it. And, 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 uh, and I think that will take up the, the news cycle for a while. Um, but, but I also think that it's not only his fraud trial, but as you suggest, uh, he's done this other thing that has gone of become orphaned in all of this because of we've moved on to, as you say, these other things. I mean, maybe there's an inevitability to that, but I would just love to see the media step up a little bit more prominently in that way. Well, don't uh, be cynical. That's my number one thing is, you know, don't be cynical. It doesn't get you anywhere. Get right, us. and and it also gets you into some nasty generalities of the sort that you were just referencing before, like uh, oh, they're all corrupt, or oh, it's all whatever. The minute you say there are degrees of everything, and there you know, and there are ways to change things. I, I've kept you over time. Thank you, David. So appreciate your contributions, and uh, and look forward to the next one. Talk to you next David week. K. Johnston. Yeah. Hi, it's Mark, and I thought that was great. Hit the notification bell. You'll know whenever there's a new video being dropped, and please subscribe to our channel to help us save the universe.